Hi. Hello, this is Grandma, and I am reading Sign of the Beaver by Elizabeth George Spear. Um, in the last chapter, uh, Matt was teaching Atien um, how to read uh, using Robinson Crusoe. So far, what does Atien think of Robinson Crusoe? Well, he doesn't like it at all because uh, the native in that book called, whose name is Friday, um, ha has been very subservient to uh, Robinson Crusoe. Um, and basically, um, he ne kneeled down in front of him and put his head on the ground and put Robinson Crusoe's foot on his head, showing that he was there to serve. Robinson Crusoe was um, somehow inferior. Well, Atien, being a native himself, did not like that at all. Chapter 10. He felt weak with relief when next morning, Atien walked stiffly into the cabin and sat down at the table. Stumbling over himself, he set about the lesson. As soon as he could, he picked up Robinson Crusoe. In the night, he carefully thought out just what he was going to say, if Atien ever gave him another chance. Now he had to talk fast because he could see that Atien was set against hearing any more about the book. Let me go on, he pleaded. It's different from now on. Friday, that's what Robinson Crusoe named him, doesn't kneel anymore. Not slave? No, 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 Matt lied. After that, they get to be, well, companions. They share everything together. Ignoring the suspicion on Atien's face, Matt began hurriedly to read. He was thankful that he knew the book so well that he was able to see when trouble might be coming. One of the first words Crusoe taught his man Friday was the word master. Luckily, he caught that one in time. And it was true, Crusoe and his new companions did go about together, sharing their adventures only Matt thought it would have been better perhaps if Friday hadn't been quite so thick-headed. After all, there must have been a thing or two about the desert island that a native who had lived there all his life could have taught Robinson Crusoe. When Matt closed the book, Atia nodded. Then, so, as so many times before, he took Matt by surprise. You like go fish? He asked. I sure would, Matt said gratefully. Stopping to pick up his fish pole from beside the door, he ran to overtake the Indian boy who strode ahead. He knew his grin was stretching from one ear to the other, but he couldn't hide his feelings as Atien did. They walked some distance, Matt managing to keep pace with the Indian's swift stride, determined not to let Atien know that his ankle was aching. They seemed to be following no particular trail. Finally, they came out on part of the creek that Matt had never seen before. It was shallow here, studded with rocks and pebbles, so that the water rippling over them made little rapids or collected in quiet pools. Here, Atien stopped, broke off a sapling, and instead of making a fish pole, drew his knife from his pouch and quickly shaved a sharp point, creating a spear. Then he stepped gently into the stream. Matt stood watching. Atien stood motionless, peering intently into a pool of clear water. All at once, he stooped, darted his spear with one quick stroke, and came up with a glittering fish. He stared at it for a moment. Too small, he decided. To Matt's astonishment, he spoke to the fish quite solemnly a few incomprehensible words, then tossed it back into the stream. In a few minutes, he'd speared another, which he judged large enough to keep. Do same, he ordered now, coming back to the bank. He handed Matt the spear. He would just look ridiculous, Matt knew before he started. He waded in, stood up to his knees, looked down into the sliding water. Presently, a fish darted past, at least he thought it was a fish, it was hard to tell which was shadow and which might be fish. At any rate, it was gone before he got his spear in the water. Presently, he saw another, this one quite definitely a fish, calmly drifting in the pool. He jabbed at it hopelessly. 
He was sure his stick actually touched the slippery thing. He lunged at it, lost his footing, and went down with a splash that would scare off any fish for miles around. When he came up dripping, he saw Atien watching him with a horrid grin. Suddenly, he felt hot in spite of the icy water. Why had Atien brought him out here anyway? Had Atien just wanted to show off his own cleverness and to make Matt look more clumsy than ever? Was this Atien's answer in case Matt had any idea in his head about being a Robinson Crusoe? For a moment, Matt glared back at Atien with a scowl as black as any Indian's. Then he wiped his nose with the back of his hand and sloshed back to the bank. He snatched up his own pole and line. He poked about under the wet leaves and found a good juicy worm and fitted it to his hook. I'll do it my own way, he said. I can catch plenty of fish with that, and that's what matters. Atien sat on the bank and watched. To Matt's satisfaction, in no time there was a tug on the line, a strong one. An impressing looking fish rose to the surface, thrashing fiercely. Matt gave a jerk, and the line came swinging out of the water so suddenly that he almost lost his footing again. It was empty. Fish broke line, Atien observed, as if anyone couldn't see that. Furious at Atien, at the fish, and at himself, Matt examined the break, unable to face the Indian. He'd lost more than a good fish. His hook had disappeared as well, the only hook he had. Of course, Atien noticed. Those black eyes never missed anything. Make new hook, he suggested. Without even getting his feet wet, he reached out, broke a twig off a maple sapling. Out came the crooked knife again. In a few strokes, he cut a piece as long as his little finger, curved a groove around the middle, and whittled both ends into a sharp points. Now he stepped into the water, tied Matt's line expertly around the groove. Put on two worms, he said, cover up all of hook. He didn't offer to find the worms. Matt had lost all interest in fishing. He knew that somehow or other, he would just provide more amusement for Atien, but he couldn't refuse. He didn't have to wait long before another fish caught hold. This time he landed it neatly. Good, said Atien from the bank, big. Matt was trying to get it off the line. He swallowed the whole hook, he said. Better white man's hook, Atien said. Turn around, inside fish, not get away. Back on the bank, Matt slit the fish, extricated, excuse me, extracted the hook in his line. But the thin twig had broken in half. Easy, make new hook, Atien said. Make many hooks. Of course, looking down at the simple thing in his hand, Matt realized he never again need worry about losing a hook. He could make a new one wherever he happened to be. It was another necessary thing that Atien had shown him, just as he had made the snare. He wasn't sure why Atien had bothered, but grudgingly he had to admit that Atien had proved to him once again that he didn't always have to depend on white man's tools. All at once, he was hungry. The sun was straight overhead, and it would be a long tramp back to the woods before he could cook the fish. Now he saw that Atien had the same thought. The Indian was heaping up small piles of pine needles and grass. He drew from his muskrat skin pouch a piece of hard stone with bits of quartz embedded in it. Striking it with his knife, he soon had a spark, which he blew into a flame. I could have done that myself, Matt thought. In fact, he had done it many times, but he'd not realized that he could use a common stone as well as a flint. Get fish ready, Atien ordered now, pointing to the two fish on the bank. Matt didn't like that masterful tone, but he did as he was told. By the time he had two fish split and gutted and washed in the creek, Atien had a fire blazing. Matt was curious to see how he would go about cooking. He watched as Atien cut two short branches, bending them first to make sure they were green. 
He trimmed and sharpened them rapidly. Then he thrust a pointed end into each fish from head to tail. A small green stick was set crosswise inside the fish to hold the sides apart. He handed one stick to Matt, one on each side of the fire. The two boys squatted and held their sticks to the blaze. From time to time, Atien fed the fire with dry twigs. When the flesh was crisp and brown, they ate, still silent. Matt licked his fingers. His resentment had vanished along with his hunger. Golly, he said, that was the best fish I ever ate. Good, Atien said. Across the fire, he looked at Matt. His eyes gleamed. He was laughing again, but somehow not with scorn. I say to him not to tell another fish. Oh, excuse me. What did you say to that fish you threw back? Matt was curious. I say to him not to tell another fish, Atien said seriously. Not scare away. You actually think that fish could understand? Atien shrugged. Fish know many things, he replied. Matt sat pondering this strange idea. Well, it seemed to work, he said finally. At least the other fish came along. A wide grin spread across Atien's face. It was the first time Matt had seen him smile. I think they're becoming friends. One morning, Matt laid his sticks, chapter 15. Laid his sticks in a row, seven sticks, each with seven notches. That meant it was well into August. The silk tassels were glistening on the corn stalks. The hard grain pumpkins nestling under the stalks were rounding out, taking on a coating of orange. It was time for his father to be coming. At any moment, he might look out and see him walking into the clearing, bringing his mother and Sarah and the new baby. It was strange to think there was a member of the family he'd never seen. Was it a boy or a girl? It could be a fine thing to have them sitting around the table again. He hoped his mother would take over the reading lessons, which were going badly. Atien still came almost every day, though there was no longer any need for him to bring meat or fish. Matt couldn't make out why the Indian kept coming since he made it so plain he disliked the lessons. So often, Atien made him feel uncomfortable and ridiculous, but he had to admit that on the days when Atien did not come, the hours went by slowly. Often, Atien seemed in no hurry to leave when the morning's lesson was over. Look, see if catch rabbit, he might suggest, and together they would go out to check the snares, or they would tramp along the creek to a good spot for fishing. Atien seemed to have plenty of time on his hands. Sometimes he would just hang around and watch Matt do the chores. He would stand at the edge of the corn patch and look on while Matt pulled up weeds. Squaw work, he commented, commented once. Matt flushed. Well, we think it's men's work, he retorted. Atien said nothing. He did not offer to help. After a time, he just wandered off without saying goodbye. It must be mighty pleasant, Matt thought to himself, to just hunt and fish all day long and not have any work to do. That wasn't his father's way. It wouldn't ever be his. The work was always waiting to be done. But if he got the corn patch cleared and the wood chopped today, he could go fishing with Atien tomorrow, if Atien invited him. Sometimes Atien brought an old dog with him. It was about the sorriest looking hound Matt had ever seen with a coat of coarse brown hair, a mangy tail, and whitish patches on its face that gave it a clownish look. Its long pointed nose was misshapen with bumps and bristles. By the look of its ears, it had survived many battles. The instant it spied Matt, a ridge of hair went straight up on its back and it let out a mean growl. Atien cuffed it sharply, and after that it was quiet, but it watched the white stranger with wary eyes and kept its distance. Matt tried not to show his own distrust. What's his name? he asked politely. Atien shrugged. No name. Aramis. Dog. If he doesn't have a name, how can he come when he's called? Hmm. My dog. Him come. As though he knew what Atien had said, that scruffy tail began to weave back and forth. Tis what? 
Atien said, good for nothing, no good for hunt, no sense, him fight anything, bear, moose. There was no mistaking the pride in Atien's voice. What's wrong with his nose? Atien grinned, him fight anything, chase Kagwa. What white man call needles all over? Oh, a porcupine. Golly, that must have hurt. Pull out many needles, some very deep, not come out. Dog not feel them now. Maybe not, Matt thought, but he doubted those quills had improved the dog's disposition. He didn't fancy this dog of Atien's. During the lesson, the dog prowled about outside the cabin and finally thumped down on the path to bite and scratch at fleas. When Atien came out, the dog leaped up, prancing and yapping as though Atien had been gone for days. Matt thought a little better of him for that. It minded him now. It, mind, it minded him how his father's dog had made a fuss every time his father came home. That old hound must have just about wagged its tail off when his father came back from Maine. The fact was, Matt was a little jealous of Atien. A dog would be mighty fine company here in the woods, no matter how scrawny it looked. But not this one. No matter how often the dog came with Atien, he never let Matt touch him, nor did Matt like him any better. He was certainly no good at hunting. When the two boys walked through the woods, the dog zigzagged ahead, sending squirrels racing up trees, jays chattering, and ruining any chance of a catch. Matt wondered why Atien wanted him along. Atien didn't pay him any mind except to shout at him and cuff him when he was too noisy. But for all his show of indifference, it was plain to Matt that Atien thought a sight of that dog. Atien had not brought the dog with him the day that he let Matt, led Matt a long distance into part of the forest that Matt had never seen. Following after him, Matt began to feel uneasy. If Atien should take himself off suddenly, as he had a way of doing, Matt was not sure he could find his way back to the cabin. It occurred to him that Atien knew this, that perhaps Atien had brought him so far just to show him how helpless he really was, how all the words in a white man's book were of no use to him in the woods. Yet he did not think this would happen. For some reason, he could not explain to himself he trusted Atien. He didn't really like him. When the Indian got that disdainful look in his eyes, Matt hated him. But somehow, as they had sat side by side, day after day, doing the lessons that neither of them wanted to do, something had changed. Perhaps it had been Robinson Crusoe or the tramping through the woods together. They didn't like each other, but they were no longer enemies. When they came upon a row of short tree stumps, birch and aspen cut off close to the ground, Matt's heart gave a leap. Were there settlers nearby or Indians? This was no proper clearing. Then he noticed that whoever had cut the trees had left jagged points on each one. No ax would cut a tree in that way. He could see marks where the trees had been dragged along the ground. Do you have any ideas on who cut it down? I do. In a few steps, the boys came out the bank of an unfamiliar creek. There Matt saw what had happened to those trees. They had been piled in a mound right over the water from one bank to the other. Water trickled through them in tiny cascades. Behind the piled up branches, a small pond stretched smooth and still. It's a beaver dam, he exclaimed, the first one I've ever seen. Qua bit, said Atien, have red tail. They're beaver wigwam. He pointed to a heap of branches at one side. Some of them new with green leaves still clinging. Matt stepped closer to look. Instantly, there was a crack of a rifle. A ring of water rippled the surface of the pond. Near its edge, a black head appeared for just a flash and vanished again in a sputter of bubbles. Atien laughed at the way Matt had started. Beaver made big noise with his tail, he exclaimed. I thought someone had shot a gun, Matt said. 
I wish I had my rifle now. Atien scowled. Not shoot, he warned. Not white man, not Indian. Young beaver not ready. He pointed to a tree nearby. Sign of beaver, he said, belong to family. Carved on the bark, Matt could make out the crude figure of an animal that could, and with some imagination, be a beaver. Sign show beaver house belonging to people of beaver, Atien explained. By and by, when young beaver all grown, people of beaver hunt here. No one hunt but people of beaver. You mean just from that mark on the tree, another hunter would not shoot here? That our way, Atien said gravely. All Indian understand. But would a white man understand? Matt wondered. He thought of Ben with his stolen rifle. It wasn't like Ben would respect an Indian sign, but he must remember to warn his father. When it seemed the beaver did not intend to show itself again, the two boys climbed back up the bank. At the row of stumps, Atien halted and signaled for Matt to go ahead. Show way to cabin, he ordered. All Matt's suspicions came rushing back. Did Atien intend to sneak off behind his back and leave him to find his way home? Is this some kind of a trick, he demanded hotly. Atien looked stern. Not trick, he said. Matt need learn. To Matt's relief, he took the lead again. After a short distance, he stopped and pointed to a broken stick leaning in the direction of the creek. A little further on, there was a small stone set against a larger one. Not far away, a tuft of dry grass dangled from the branch of a small tree. Indian makes sign, Atien said, always make sign to tell way. Matt must say, not get lost in forest. Now Matt remembered how Atien had paused every so often, sometimes to break off a branch that hung in their path, once to nudge it aside a stone with the toe of his moccasin. He'd done these things so quickly that Matt had paid no mind. He saw now that Atien had carefully been leaving markers. Of course, he explained. But my father always made blazes on the tree with his knife. Atien nodded. That's white man's way. Indian maybe not want to show where he go, not want hunters to find beaver house. Oh, so these were secret signs. Nothing anyone following them would notice. It would take a sharp eyes to find them, even if you knew they were there. Matt do same, Atien repeated. Always make sign to show way back. He plodded along behind Atien, trying to spot the signs before Atien could point them out. All at once, as a thought struck him, he almost laughed out loud. He remembered Robinson Crusoe and his man Friday. He and Atien had sure enough turned that story right around about. Whenever they went a few steps from the cabin, it was the brown savage who strode ahead leading the way, knowing just what to do and doing it quickly and skillfully. And Matt, a puny sort of Robinson Crusoe, tagged along behind, grateful for the smallest sign that he could do anything right. It wasn't that he wanted to be a master, and the idea of Atien's being anyone's slave was not to be thought of. He just wished he could make Atien think a little better of him. He wanted Atien to look at him without that gleam of amusement in his eyes. He wished that it were possible for him to win Atien's respect. As though Atien sensed that Matt was disgruntled, he stopped, whipped out his knife, and neatly sliced off two shining globs of dried sap from a nearby spruce. He grinned and held out one of them like a peace offering. Shaw, he ordered. He popped the other piece in his mouth and began to chew with evident pleasure. Gingerly, Matt copied him. The gob fell to pieces between his teeth. 
filling his mouth with bitter juice. He wanted to spit it out in disgust, but Atien was plainly enjoying the stuff. So he stubbornly forced his jaws to keep moving. In a moment, the bits came together in a rubbery gum, and the first bitterness gave way to fresh piney taste. To his surprise, it was very good. The two boys tramped on, chewing companionably once more. Matt acknowledged to himself, Atien had told him another secret of the forest. So Atien has now showed him how to chew gum. Gum not being the same kind of gum we have, but gum coming from the sap of a tree. Okay, I'm going to stop here. Um, it was, I thought it was interesting as some of you may um, hunt or go out in the wilderness and maybe you've gotten some ideas of things that you can do when you're out with your buddies at a cabin. Bye-bye.